was coming, he was coming with rescue for the people of God, healing for the broken. But he was coming with justice and recompense, with vengeance against everyone who stood against the authority of God. The problem is that doesn't jive together. It's like, so which one is it? So they couldn't understand how there would be this, this person who would come who would redeem and rescue people who had sat in darkness, people who were without help, the broken. But he was going to go and crush every enemy that had come against his people. It didn't make sense. They were looking for this conquering hero who would show up. So all of Israel was waiting. But God in his wisdom and his... And this is where you start to see as you read books like Hebrews. You start to see the forbearance of God in sending his son Jesus that first time. What do we call this season? We call it Advent, right? What is Advent? The coming. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ was not a one-time affair. Because that's what they were all expecting. It would be this one big event. And there he comes, riding in to redeem us and to save us, to set us, and he will be our king. But it didn't happen that way. Here comes Jesus in the form of a weak, the weakest thing that we know, a baby. Someone so dependent on somebody else's care. How could this be the one who saves us? But let me read from Isaiah. Verse 13 says, Who has measured the Spirit of the Lord? And what man has shown him his counsel? Whom did he consult? Who has made God understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and shown him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket and are accounted for as dust on scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands and like fine dust. I want you to see the picture here of who we're dealing with. All of Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, that is wood, to make an altar. Nor are all the beasts enough for burnt offerings. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? This is God asking them a question. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it? A goldsmith overlays it with gold and then casts it with silver chains? He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will rot. And he seeks, it, seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. When he stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He who brings princes to nothing and brings the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Verse 25, to whom will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. God, in the book of Isaiah, you will see him do this repeatedly. If you read through the chapters, he brings them back to this simple clause which he made when he made his covenant with the nation of Israel. I am the Holy One of Israel. I am the Holy One. There is no one like me, but you are my people. You belong to me. You are holy to me. So when we look at the church of Jesus Christ today, we're approaching Jesus as our Savior, and we're so thankful for the work, and we're so glad that He came to save us. But we often lose in the translation that there was nobody else who could have done this for you. 
Nobody. If I wanted to lay my life down for all of you here today, if I wanted to cover your debt, to go into the deepest places to say, Lord, I will take me instead. You know how we have that? That sense of selflessness that you see on the earth today? None of those people could have done that for you. There was only one, because there was only one who had a name that could appease the judgment of God. There was only one who was covenanted. There was only one who had authority of over all other gods. And God makes a draws attention to that. This is why he says, I am the Holy One. And I want to bring you back to one of the first names that you see God have. It is Elohim, which, is to, which means God in general. But God specifies in Genesis chapter 14, he says, when Melchizedek brings Abraham an offering, it says, and shares communion with him, it says he is God most high, El Elyon. He's not just God. He is God, the most high God. He's not like the other gods, the gods of the nations, the gods of our universe, the gods that we have set up for ourselves, that we've crafted with wood and with gold and with all of the things that we have. Today, our God is money. Today, our God is pleasure. Sure, you're not building an idol and have a temple to it, but guess what? There is a big temple called your t television, right? Or whatever it is, you, you choose it, your investment portfolio. What is your idol that you have created that you say, I worship at the feet of these things and I watch for it every single morning? And he says, I am the most high. To whom will you liken me? To whom will you to give such attention to? You give attention to so many things. So don't, don't for a second say, I'm, I don't give attention to those things. I worship the Lord. That is what Israel was saying. And he, he calls to them and he says, do you not realize that I am the Holy One? To whom will you liken me? Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, my way is hidden from the Lord. He doesn't really care about me, so I really shouldn't busy God. Have you not known, have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God? The creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. That is where we pick up the verses usually. Right? They who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. We all love that verse. It's in the context of him saying, this is who I am. You've forgotten who I am. You are comparing me to just, you know, your little lucky charm. Lord, uh, you know. Pray that today goes well. Pray that today goes well. I'm the God who gives you breath. I'm the God who has fashioned everything you see. The job that you have, the marriage that you seem to need help with, all of that, I'm the God who sustains all things. Now, let us read Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15, and this is a verse we will come back to again and again. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Every single thing. For he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything, he might have the first place. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself what things? All things, 
whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So when you and I talk about Jesus, it better not be a little baby in a manger. There was a much bigger story at play. We get tricked into thinking it was just a nice story. He was setting up a battle for the ages, which he says, I am going to come and rescue, snap out of the hand of the enemy those who are not covenanted to me, which is what confused all of Israel. They were like, why is he talking about other nations? He says, there are people to be rescued. And he comes this first time, his first advent was so that he could rescue. Now Melchizedek, if you read Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1, he says, Melchizedek means he is the king of peace and the king of righteousness. The first time he came, and it was, it was funny because it's like, how is this contained in one person? He came the first time as the king of peace. He established there is no more war. That I am putting an end to every single place there has been war between humanity and God. There is no longer, you are no longer enemies of God. For in, as many as received him, he gave them the right to be called children of God. So you sitting here today... The likelihood is you are not of Jewish heritage connected to some of the ancient promises that God made to those people. Like, you, like me, we are people who believed a message. And he says, to those people, I give them the right to be my children. They are my people. You are now holy. You are set out from the world to be his own. Your family. Your family now. Though it's a poor example, you got to think like almost Italian mob style. Your family. <laughs> it's like once you're in, I don't care what you did, your family. I don't care what your past is, your family now. And he stands there and he says, who? Tell me who wants to bring a charge against God's elect? Who would dare come up against the Holy One? Not just anyone, not just G-O-D God, the Most High God. Do you see why this context needs to be clear in your heart? We're not just dealing with somebody. We're not just dealing with a deity. Oh, it's the Christian's God. No, 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 no. You're dealing with God who fashioned all things and all of these other gods which are mere imitations and all these other gods which are spirits and demonic powers that have them behind them will all bow. This is the God you're dealing with. So this is not just a, another religion's attempt at a salvation story. Do you get me? Because this is what our world today has reduced this to. I, yeah, yeah, this is your thing. We got this, you got that. And we, we, you know, give a little, live a little. When Jesus comes back, and this is what I'm trying to get the stage set for. His second advent, which is what the, the song Joy to the World is about. If you've ever heard Joy to the World, it wasn't about Jesus in a manger. It's about the fact, joy to the world, the Lord is coming. He is about to rule the nations. He comes to make His blessings flow. As far as the curse is found, He's gone after it. He's gone after it. And He rules the world with truth and with grace. And He will make the nations prove the glories of His righteousness. That didn't happen 2,000 years ago. And that's what confused everybody. They're like, isn't he about to like do his thing? He was opening a window that you and I might come in. And there has been a gap. We are living in a gap. So if you were to say the advent of Jesus, the advent of his anointed one, the Christ, 
If you take it as one event, it was one event split across time. It started 2,000 years ago, and we're living in this period called an age of grace, where he says, I'm holding back. It's the forbearance of God. He says, I'm holding back my coming. Which is why it confused them. He, he, Jesus stands up in the temple. He takes Isaiah and he says, This is the day of the favor of the Lord. And he stops. And he closes the scroll and gives it back. And they're like, excuse me, you're, you're messing with God's word. What, why are you stopping? You finish the sentence. The day of the favor of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Why didn't you read that? Because right now is not that time. Because he closed it and he says, this is being fulfilled. So you and I are sitting in the in-between. And when we deal with the Holy One, we are coming to someone who is more than just our Savior. We're coming to someone who we have been set apart for. We have been called by His name. It matters that we bear the name of Jesus. He is not just our Savior. He is my King of righteousness. And I await His coming. Which is why He tells us in Revelation, all of you, to those who say, Come, Lord, quickly. We're awaiting your return. Like the virgins who had their oil in their lamps. We are waiting for your return. We're not sitting there going, Oh, isn't it nice we made it to another Christmas? This is a great opportunity for me to teach my children. He, the king is coming. If you read Tolkien or C.S. Lewis, Aslan's not dead. He's coming. The king is coming. Just when you think Sauron has conquered all that you can see. There is no hope left. He is coming. Are you waiting? Are you expectant of His return? Are you someone who's saying, come, come, Lord Jesus, come. So when I reach 2023 December, Christmas Day, it, yeah, I, I mean, don't ever get me wrong. I might have been someone who was very brash before about these things. I understand why it is such a precious time to be with family and to love Christmas presents and all of that. I love that. I now understand that. I did not earlier. Now, when, now that the legalistic part of me has been put away, I start to see, my brothers, my sisters, do you see that we must tell our families about the king who is coming? Not by chance, not by way of extension, by way of necessity. Are you ready for the king? Are you ready? Has he got room in your heart? Has he got room in your home? Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. Therefore God has exalted him and given him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He is the... So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. That is in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every single place that there is. I choose now. I choose now. I'm not going to wait... For the end to bow my knee. When you and I come to a church meeting. I love the songs we chose for worship today. It brings us back. To the singularity. Of why we are here. Sure I love spending time with you. I love that we get to fellowship together. But we got to be clear. We are here for one thing. Great is the Lord. And he is great. So great that it, His name deserves to be praised continually. We cannot liken Him to just being our deity for the Sunday. Do you, get, do you get me? He can be reduced to that in our eyes. 
And that's an assessment you need to make in your heart, not for me to make. Lord, have I got calloused to the religious, religious, religiosity, whatever you want to call it, of being Christian and calling you my God, but in heart I have not treated you as holy. I've not set you apart in my estimation. So I pray that the eyes of your heart are enlightened to these things. That Christ may dwell in your heart. Can we read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 21 together, if you have your Bible? <clears throat> According to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power, through his spirit in your inner being. This is a work of the Holy Spirit. This is not me convincing you. I hope you see that. It's not about my words that are going to convince you. It is a revelation of God that needs to happen. Which is why when we look at the world and all of those things that we want to fix so desperately, this takes a work of the Spirit of God. For those loved ones that you right now in this season are thinking about and say, Lord, I ask that you would have mercy on them, that you would draw them to yourself. This is what you're praying for them. I would encourage you to read this passage and pray it over them. People that once knew the Lord and have walked away, pray this over them. Because it's not a matter of convincing them or them seeing that Christians are actually not as bad as whatever society is showing us right now. The church is messed up. Christians are messed up. The issue is, have we met with the Holy One? That changes everything. I pray that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, and when it say love, it's not just love generic, love agape, the love of God. Have the strength to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses our knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And this is my commendation. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than what we can ask or think. According to the power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So this becomes our refrain. This becomes my daily prayer. Lord, I want to see You glorified. I want to see You as the Most High. Every time I reduce you down to just being my little buddy, buddy, I share Jesus, I can share my problems with Jesus. Sure, He is your best friend. But don't for a second forget, He is the one who holds the nations like a drop in a bucket. He's the one who stands over everything. I often have this chat with my sons. Because now I've got teenage, almost. So we're getting to that stage. Right? And I was like, I want you to understand. You can sit with me. You can lay on me. You can jump on me. You can, you know, we can play, like wrestle on the carpet or whatever it is. We can do all of those things. For a second, don't forget, I am your father. When you talk to me, remember I'm your father. Not because I'm like, oh, I'm your big grizzly dad, and I will tell you, I'm, you say yes, sir, and only speak when you're spoken. No, it's not that. I want you to have the privilege of the friendship we share, but I don't want you to ever forget the position I have in your life. And this is something that we often have to remember in church. Jesus is your best friend. Jesus loves you to pieces. And you get to share with uh, him all the things, pour your heart out. You're mad, you're angry, sad. Great, but remember who you're dealing with. So in humility, receive the word implanted that is able to save your soul. That's Jude verse 20. 
When you start to remember these things, you start to respond to truth in a way that says, Lord, you are right and I'm wrong. Sure, I can share my struggles with you and I can say it as it is. I don't have to fake it. But you are holy. Teach me to number my days. That I may be wise and present to you a heart of wisdom. A heart that sees you as you really are. In Leviticus chapter 10, and this is where I want to draw the end conclusion. Why are we talking about this? Because this is in Leviticus chapter 10, and I'm not, I don't have this verse there. In verses 10 and 11, this is while God was giving them the law. It seemed so convoluted and, you know, what, what's the big idea? He was teaching them something. I want you, in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, it says, you are to distinguish between the holy and common, between the unclean and the clean. And you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. There was a reason he was doing this. It wasn't just to show them how the law was going to be so hard for them and that they could never, ever attain to it. That was part of it. But he wanted to have a deep-seated understanding in them. God is not like anybody else. The things of God are not like anything else. When I sing to the Lord, it's not me just singing a song. Do you get me? When I clap my hands, I'm not just clapping to cheer for something. So when we worship corporately, I want you to mark these things clearly. We're not trying to gin up an ex a, a response from you. We're not trying to get you hype. We don't need that in this church. But what we do need is you to recognize that everything you do is holy unto the Lord. Holy. It is not cheap. Oh, I don't do singing. I don't... Uh, he said sing. Not because he's like, dance for your supper, buddy. No, it's, it's, it's not that. But he's saying, this brings truth alive within you that teaches you who I am. And when I respond with my mouth, truth starts to get formed. So don't sit there on Wednesday saying, I don't know why I don't understand. I don't know why I don't believe this and it doesn't make sense. Guess why it doesn't make sense? Because you don't do the things that he's asked you to do. do, do are you hearing me? It's not about reading all the YouVersion Bible app stories that there are, or the devotionals that you have, or the podcasts that you have. Those things will not establish you in truth if you don't work with it. This is what working with it means. To say, if the Lord says, sing to the Lord a new song, sing. If he says, shout aloud to the Lord, shout aloud to the Lord. If he says, lift your hands to him, lift your hands. There are times in my family, I did not know what to pray for my home. All he said was, lift your hands. Oh, that's so weird. What am I going to do? What am I doing? Like, swatting the air? Your word said it, and I'm going to respond to it. Why? Because it's not weird, because you're the holy one. If you call me to do something, if you call me to bow down, oh, I don't do the kneeling thing. That, that was from Catholic Church. I don't care. Do it. Why? Because he asked me to. Not anybody asking me to do it. I will do it in response to the God who is holy. I refuse to bow to the traditions of man. I refuse to, to conform to whatever this church's hype model is. But I will do it in response to the Holy One. So can we just bow our heads and just say, Lord, are there places in me that you are calling me to holy things? That I might recognize the holiness of God. That you're completely set apart. That there is no one like you. Lord, I ask that you'd open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, to understand these things. That we will not trivialize the simple things that you tell us. 
Lord, that we would open the eyes of our heart, Lord God, and perceive these things. That your spirit would show us these things in your word. You would show us these things, Lord, in the encouragements we receive from one another. You would show us, Lord God, by the working of power in miracles and signs. That we would not run from these things. That we would not minimize. That we would not discredit these things. Because you are the Holy One. You are the Most High. So Lord, I ask for godly conviction. Lord, you know each heart in this room and online. Lord, and you know where our hearts are seeking after you. So Lord, I ask in your gracious way, not with judgment, not with, with abrasiveness, Lord, you come and you bring correction. You bring places of alignment. Lord, that we would set aside the things that are unclean, the things that are tainted with the things of this earth, and we would present to you a heart that says, Lord, I belong to you. Lord, this Christmas season, I want to worship you. I want to honor you. I want to await your coming as the one who is mine. Lord, as the one who has been sent for my sin. As the one who has been sent to be my Lord and King. I receive you, Lord, with gladness. I receive you, Lord, with expectation. I receive you, Lord, for all that you are. Teach me your way. Teach me your way. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray that this is just a start. That as you go through this week, the Lord will start to show you like, hey, I got a little nugget for you. I want to show you something of who I am. It might be in song. It might be... Just in quietness. Respond to the Lord as He draws you to. And remember, you're responding to holiness. You're not responding to Christianity. Never respond to Christianity because that never got people too far. A system never got people too far. But encounters with God cannot be counterfeited. The thing is, we have a system in our world today which gins up a certain response, and then people are like, why am I left expecting something else at the end of it? And we got to stop that in the church. There is an expectation that we leave people with, and then after the church service is over, I, my life still looks the same. I didn't make any difference. And this is what people are calling out. This is what the world... And those who have walked away from church are calling out. We have bought into a system, but the encounters with the Holy One were missing. So when we gather together, is there a holiness about us? Is there a, an awareness of, I am meeting with the Lord. I must respond to His voice. So when a brother or a sister comes and shares something with you, receive it as on something holy from the Lord. Do you understand? That changes everything. If it is something great and exciting, you receive it with gladness. If it is something that's corrective or something that's admonishing, receive it in that context. And as someone who's giving, be someone aware. Ah, this is holy unto the Lord. I dare not try and get legalistic about what I have. Do you, do you understand when I was sharing about Christmas and all of that? I used to be someone, you could have called me the Grinch. My wife would have called me the Grinch. Like, I grew up in a culture where it was all about just devoted to worshiping God. So the moment you started talking about Christmas trees and presents, you're like, this isn't the Jesus thing, so we're not doing that. And you lose out on the benefit of some of these moments with your family to actually work with these things. Right? So that's where legalism gets the better of us. So that's where I'm saying, I had to see that in how God was working with my heart. As I grew in marriage, as I grew in love, as I grew in so many things, I had to learn how do I minister what God has given me of saying, this is what you should focus on, without me losing myself and being like, I was not honoring what God is doing in other people. Right? 
So do that. So as, as you go through the, these next few weeks, make room in your heart for people who are not where you're at. Make room for people to say, I have met with the Lord. I didn't meet with Christmas. I met with the Lord. And when you start to see that happening in people's hearts, those are encounter points. Where God starts to say, I'm going to blow the lid off of this thing. Because you have responded in simplicity by putting a meal before them. Right? Or you have given them a little present. Or you sung a little Christmas carol. Whatever it is. There is power in each of these things because you're responding to the holiness of God. When you do it as such, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit takes it and does amazing things with it. And it will no longer be a tradition. It will be something that is life-giving. I have just one announcement for today, which is, drum roll, <laughs> we have our Christmas 